and his latest book, which we're going to be discussing today, Self-Organizing Multi-Agent Systems, Algorithmic Foundations of Cyber Anarcho-Socialism. Uh, this, my, the, the first book that I did actually write uh, myself. Uh, and so I've actually uh, worked with and published with uh, people from all these different disciplines, linguistics, philosophy, psychology, law, political science, neuroscience, fashion design, and indeed, uh, and indeed medicine. Yeah. From the artificial intelligence perspective, I was trying to solve engineering problems by designing artificial intelligent algorithms which were inspired by the way that groups of people would solve similar problems. And they would have a theory about how this might be done. And that theory would inspire us uh, to write mathematical models of what was going on. And from those mathematical models, we could derive algorithms uh, to see if we could solve um, our engineering problem. Yeah. So you, what you really want to do is to uh, address societal problems by designing socio-technical systems which would consist of interacting human and computational intelligences. So the human intelligence have got this way of doing things and our computational level intelligence, which would have these algorithms for doing it, and then see if we could make a, a socio-technical system that would solve a, a social problem, was to try to understand and evaluate the social impact of what happens when we embed these socio-technical systems back into the very society that they inspired the original algorithms is that there was this convergence on, on public interest technology. Now, I had no idea about that. The, the setting then for this is, is this, this mapping from PI double T to PIT yeah, is, of course, the, the digital transformation for digital society, that thing which is going on all around us as we speak. We observe the increasing use of digital tools and technology in the digitalization and automation of social and organizational processes, structures, and relations. Uh, and that is creating for us uh, a significant challenge. You know, we have to engineer ever more complex uh, cyber-physical and socio-technical systems. Now, the cyber-physical systems are those which are just going to be the ones that are, are interacting computational intelligences and our socio-technical systems are the ones which have our interacting human and computational intelligences. Uh, and we want to solve uh, wicked problems. And, and wicked problems are defined as those social problems that, that uh, don't actually have an end state. These social problems uh, don't have a, an end state and they don't necessarily have a criteria for even knowing that you've reached some kind of um, end point. This is everything from you know, the, the organizational rules that, that we work in through to our interaction um, with infrastructure, through to our uh, access to medicine, to news, to entertainment, the way we even interact with our, our local environment. All of these things are being changed in this way. And you know, when we look at some of the most pressing um, problems that we face today, um, for example, you know, climate change, for example, you know, we need to have societal transformation of some kind to address these global challenges. Yeah? But the, the, the fascinating thing about this is the, um, the rate of change is actually outstripping the rate at which the sociologists can understand these changes. So the idea, of course, is that you, you, know, you actually form a community. You, you, you team up with other smart houses to form a smart village, and you, you either buy or sell energy, or you lend or borrow energy amongst yourselves. But even then, with a, a smart village of this kind, you might see daily or even uh, yearly fluctuations. So what do you do? You, you get together with other villages and you form a smart town. And, um, uh, and at some point, you actually connect yourselves to, 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 the, to the, your national grid to, to make up uh, uh, any shortfall or to sell any excess. Or you could actually interact with them and you know, get them to decide what needs to be turned off in such a way. Yeah. And so now we actually have humans in the loop because we really have a, a partnership between our computational and our human intelligence. So how are we going to, how are we going to solve it? Well, here it is. Here's, here's the, the, the solution. It, it's uh, self-organizing multi-agent systems. We can look upon these situations uh, as involving a set of uh, autonomous and heterogeneous uh, peers, 
uh, whether they're human or computational intelligence. Uh, and they have to interact in such a way as to solve a collective action problem. You know, these kinds of social dilemmas have been hugely dis studied in philosophy and economics uh, under the umbrella of game theory, the, the science of strategic interaction, if you like. It's given that you model the people involved in these situations as players. There are a set of actions that are available to them and a set of outcomes that will happen depending on uh, what choices each player makes. And this is a scene, uh, uh, I should probably attribute it, but from the film The Seventh Seal, directed by Ingmar Bergman. I strongly recommend watching this film. It's an absolute masterpiece uh, for a reason. And uh, this is the classic scene, which has been mocked mercilessly, um, but it has our hero of the film playing chess with, uh, with death. And, and our hero survives for as long as he can keep the game going. There's also social choice theory because we have to make, uh, make decisions sometimes about, you know, collectively about what we're going to do. We might have to aggregate information. Uh, and this is a scene uh, actually from a, uh, uh, a game that um, one of my students developed to, to model the kinds of social dilemmas that you would get in uh, these smart villages. It's also possible for things to go wrong. It's also possible that we're going to come up with some rules for this system, which I can say, well, we're going to uh, behave according to this way. Uh, and we might find that uh, th these rules are, are, can be broken in, in certain ways. Yeah. So we have to find ways of resolving disputes. And I've actually used the UN Sustainable Development Goals here as an example, because uh, of these 16 sustainable development goals, you can't satisfy all of them at the same time. People were able to manage common pool resources by doing exactly what I just said, by actually not bowing to the inevitability that might be predicted by some kind of game theoretic results, but actually saying, well, actually what we do to avoid these things is we, we precisely do this. We come up with sets of rules uh, in order to, to, to manage uh, ourselves but you know the, the the irony is of course because these rules can be broken and the games themselves can be manipulated we have a whole range of other problems that come as a result of this but i should uh, blot this out but alexa had decided that this was a dictatorship and the only way that she could possibly keep order in this place was telling the others what to do <laughs> i mean and this can have i mean obviously we'll come back to this this can have good or bad things because uh, it, it depends it's one thing to say that something is 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 fair, uh, sorry, is sustainable, for example, in terms of you know, being able to maintain a set of common pool resources. But it's another question is whether people's uh, access to this uh, common pool and whether what they're able to appropriate from it and what is demanded of them to provide to it is in some sense fair. You know, and, and this is the whole nature of distributive justice you know, these rules are just made up you know we, we we don't quite pluck them out of thin air but but we we construct rules and we actually you know i mean it's an act of human brilliance ingenuity you know, that that you know not only do we create these sets of rules you know, but we can also find ways of associating values and attributing good things to people who follow these sets of rules. Yeah? Knowledge management is a, is a key property of maintaining some form of uh, uh, democracy, uh, if you like, that uh, at least this is what uh, um, my friend and colleague uh, at Stanford University, Josiah Ober, uh, wrote about um, uh, classical Athens was that they managed to sustain their democracy for so long, um, or sorry, maintain their city state in the way it was and outperform all the others on the peninsula at that time was not because of this one person, one vote democracy thing. It's because they actually had particular methods of managing knowledge, which allowed them to solve public action and collective action problems uh, in ways which were uh, better than anybody else could do it at the time. But in a very charitable way, this is perhaps what Alexa had in mind 
uh, when she had a said, right, this is a dictatorship. It's the only way that I can get you guys to put out the rubbish, clean up the kitchen, do your washing up, is by telling you what to do. And everybody else goes, well, actually, you know, that's fine, you know, because everybody gets the same number of jobs. Everybody does the same amount of work. You know, um, you know um, we, we accept this. Yeah? And, and when you think about, you know, you know we, we do accept this. Um, anyway, I hope you uh, also enjoy the Escher-inspired um, uh, front cover. And this kind of sums it up to me, really. Because, I mean, one thing is that actually there are these paradoxes going on all the time. And second thing, you, you have to often plug all sorts of strange things together in, in odd ways. But the overall effect is, is quite appealing. Yeah? With the, the the cover, the the both the, the paradoxical and the sort of uh, Rube Goldberg machine nature uh, of these systems, the way we put things together. So here we are. We're trying to engineer a self-organizing socio-technical system to solve a wicked problem. You know, if you're looking at it from a, a, a knowledge management perspective, you know, the thing that you're trying to address is how do you make information available for socially productive purposes. If you look at it from a collective action perspective, is how is it that we do achieve cooperation, coordination of autonomous entities at scale and without a centralized authority that's telling everybody what to do? How do we specify the structures, processes, checks and balances that will actually make this government system stable, robust, resilient, and above all legitimate? Socio-technical systems, there's a whole range of qualitative human social values that we are actually concerned with. You know, not just justice, but rights and so on. And also there's a, there's a question of identity. Yeah? How do you make reliable transactions and establish consensual trust relationships in, in decentralized systems? And of course, this is something that you know, Kat really knows huge amounts. You know, this goes beyond uh, what's called value-sensitive design, where you actually try to make the values as the... Um, the priority, uh, sort of like super functional requirements and design with them in mind. This is what we might call sustainability design. By design did this was to actually make up some rules where people voluntarily agreed to abide by uh, in order to, to maintain the system. We shouldn't trust to luck to come up with the rules. We should actually design our institutions such that they have these properties um, right from the start. If you're going to go to a cyber physical system where you've got a whole bunch of agents involved in this, yeah, you know, rather than um, you know, uh, allowing them to try and evolve a set of rules uh, or, or, or appeal to these principles, why don't we turn the principles actually into code so that the agents are running by these codes, yeah, and you know, but self-modifying code, if you like, so the agents can actually modify them uh, while the, this this is running, and we actually showed that you know um, that uh, sensor networks, for example, or ad hoc networks, where you've got to pool some common pool resources like battery power, bandwidth, um, storage, and so on. Yeah? Um, you could actually sustain these when all of these principles were in place, and if they weren't, then then some would be missing. Yeah? I don't want to get into all these principles, but I'll give you another example. So that's uh, this one's discussed in chapter six of this this, this book. Uh, another one, chapter ten. You, know, if it is that uh, democracy is 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 your your goal, and you know what the features of the democracy are, uh, you can design for this as well. So this is um, uh, uh, something that I basically took from. Um, working with uh, Josh Ober, where he had this uh, thought experiment called Demopolis and say, well, you know, if you could just create this city state yeah, and say to people, okay, you know, your main objective here uh, is, is the avoidance of tyranny. You know? you know, you've all said that the one thing you don't want is some form of tyranny and you don't want majoritarian tyranny either, where, you know, whatever the majority says, that's what we're going to do. Yeah? These are the, the, in fact, the principles of democracy design, and that we could actually put these into code and run simulations where we had systems that were uh, uh, using these these principles.
we've got design principles for all of these different issues of, of, of public interest. Yeah. Uh, how do we uh, operationalize? What are the features of, of public interest technology that could use these different sets of design principles? Yeah? Well, uh, one of the key ones here, codification of uh, deep social knowledge, the fact that there is all this knowledge in the social sciences from economics and sociology and political science yeah, uh, about how to make these systems sustainable and uh, fair and uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, legitimate. Yeah? And we want to be able to encode that somehow uh, in our systems. Yeah? recommendation for, for trying to do this kind of thing is something called Platform Ocean. So Platform Ocean uh, is this, uh, this system that says that basically, actually, you really want to democratize, and democratize in the sense of make open for all, um, the ability to start up um, your own social media platform, for example, yeah. a software repository which has uh, this platform that you can download and you can then just configure and start running your own server, yeah, your, your own your own platform. Yeah. And so the thing is, people um, write down, <coughs> you know, download, start running their own server. They host it, however, on a desktop machine, and they customize it according to using these plugins that they can also find in a in a repository. Yeah. So, you know, if I need a particular piece of application for a certain um, uh, function that I want, you know, I can get it from my plugin repository, plug it into my system, configure it, and I'm gone. Yeah. So we, we just have um, a, a single universal uh, app that allows you to download um, things which will talk to these platforms. But in particular, you, know, you can configure what the interface to this platform is going to be looking like. So, you know, it could be anything from just a pure chat-based system, in which case I'll need one type of plugin for my interface, or it could be sort of, you know, some uh, massive 3D immersive world, in which case I'm going to need some other client interface and some other plugins to, to do this. Yeah. All the data that you transfer or that you release about your own identity stays on that one instance of that platform. Yeah. So, so here, this, this user is, is got identities on this platform institute one and platform institution two, and is interacting through them through the same app with different databases, but essentially the interactions are self-contained within you know, these conversations that are going on here. And so the data now is completely being self-contained within each platform. And it's up to the people you know, the users on that platform to decide what it is that they want to, to do with that data. And of course, this is where defining your own rules comes in. Uh, it's called Urban Refill. And I've got a little small video to show you. To Our through. aim is to help communities reuse plastic bottles, form connections, and ultimately reduce plastic pollution. With Urban Refill, members and coordinators work in collaboration to refill plastic bottles of household goods, such as shampoo, washing up liquid, and hand soap. As a member, you can make a profile, scan in your unique barcoded bottle, learn more about the products that you're buying, and connect with your community. Refilling a bottle is easy. Simply drop your empty bottle off at the coordinator's location who stores the products in bulk. Within seven days, the coordinator will return your refilled bottle back to you. The coordinator scans in empty bottles to generate a refill workflow. Through the member map, the coordinator can see where the bottles need to be dropped off and when, so that a logical route can be mapped. Through the information page, both members and coordinators can ask questions, help each other and chat. And finally, both individual and community achievements are displayed allowing members and coordinators to see the impacts of their reuse on effects such as CO2 emissions saved and animal lives protected. As individuals and as a community, you'll earn badge rewards when reaching certain milestones, so you'll always know what a great contribution you're making. So that's Urban Refill, an app designed to help you reduce plastic pollution, protect our planet and connect with your community. You know, this idea of um, you know, reducing plastic usage being a matter of public interest uh, and the idea that um, 
uh, <clears throat> you, know, you have a small group of people that are recycling their bottles, yeah, but they have their, their own private platform to do this, and another group has their own platform to do this. And you can see that there was a map there. Well, that map should just be um, uh, a plugin, for example, to be able to, um, uh, when you need map type functionality, it's just a plugin and you can use it for, for free. And this is how you know, we, we could start you know, really building up uh, and empowering communities from the bottom up by giving them the, the technology that they can use to build these things. That the, the subtitle of this book was uh, Principles of uh, Cyber Anarcho-Socialism. I wanted to try and share with you, you know, actually the, the, the principles of cyber anarcho-socialism, it, it started off as a bit of a joke. And there's like five points about the anarcho and five points about the socialism, which I'd like to just leave you with. It's not that anarchy is, is like no rules, yeah? Uh, what we're really trying to get at is the fact that there's, there's no rules that, you know, that can't actually justify themselves. I mean, you know, uh, and again, it, it, it really picks up on this issue that I mentioned earlier, that you, it's no form of governance is legitimate without some form of meaningful consent. Yeah. Is that our individuality and our um, uh, solitude and our independence actually depends on collectiveness um, and solidarity with uh, others in a community. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, really want to try and uh, emphasize the communitarian and cooperative aspects of uh, anarchist theory and practice. And in particular, the, the notions of gift economies. And this is something that I think we've completely lost track of. Uh, but, you know, many uh, societies uh, operated on, on the idea of, uh, of gifts. And it wasn't the, the object itself that was necessarily so valuable, but it was the meaning that was attached to the object and what it symbolized and what it enabled that was so important. Uh, there's a reason why it's said to be in circulation and we call it currency. You know, it's because it has this, what in the military terms we called uh, a force multiplier. The need for local communities to have minimal rights to, to self-organize, which are recognized and respected by uh, external authorities. You know. and, and as Kat will tell you, you know, it's a fundamental problem of the the ownership of data. And you can see why you know, in the UK, um, the big tech companies are desperate to get hold of the NHS databases. It's also the case that the function of the society and government has to be rooted in the underlying economic system. And that doesn't mean surveillance capitalism, frankly, of the type that I've just been talking about in the data ownership. It doesn't mean techno-feudalism, whereby you, know, you receive your payment in a cryptocurrency and that cryptocurrency can be controlled in terms of what it is you can and cannot buy with it. We do want to have uh, uh, universal education in the values of civic participation and you know, uh, sharing the burden of self-governance. And this is one of the things you know, that um, uh, it's been talked about in America about the decline of civic participation. Uh, I think it's crucial that you know, one of the things that we could do with, with platform ocean is actually build citizens' assemblies. And not just citizens' assemblies, but you know, students' assemblies. You know, put this kind of thing into a school. Yeah? I mean, I just think it's absolutely unbelievable that the Brexit referendum made a decision which was skewed by people who had been given the power and vote, taking away rights from young people who didn't have the right to participate in the decision that was going to affect them for the rest of their lives. I mean, it's just fundamentally unfair. You know, his basic democracy is literally about a form of self-governance, which is delimited by this notion of civic dignity. Yeah? That you know, it, it sort of like defines it as you know, that you're socially accepted as a civic participant, and that kind of induces you to so social behavior. And it's undermined if you're tricked into making a decision that you would not have made had you been appraised uh, of all the facts. Yeah. I think that we as a species actually evolved the capacity to engage in politics because it offers an effective and efficient and mutually beneficial way to solve these collective action problems, wicked problems of the kind that I was talking about. 
And, and they will inevitably arise when you get a group of individuals which have different preferences, priorities, and they have to live together. Uh, and it gets worse when you do that at scale. And you know, the, this program is, is the way out of this. And you know, in particular, if we can put this program into technologies of the kind that Katina has been advancing with such, um, such brilliance and such passion uh, for the last uh, few years. There's a bit of nominative determinism involved in all this, of course. Um, that's a picture of Jeremiah, the prophet of doom outside the ruins of Jerusalem. And uh, what he's writing on that bit of parchment is, I told you so, <laughs> because he predicted the fall of Jerusalem and no one believed him. Uh, and that's that picture there is of Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, the, the film. Yeah. Um, I went to Japan for a conference one time and I came back. And when I came back, this film had just opened up. And so I took my, my, my young children to go and see this film, this charming, charming movie. Uh, and at the end of it, you know, it said, oh, this film was made in Japan. And as we came out, one of my daughters said to me, um, did you go to Japan to do the voiceover for Eeyore? Because apparently I sound exactly like Eeyore in this film. <laughs> so I have a belief in, in human nature. I think we can do better than this. Whether our societies are made up of multi-agent systems, purely in silicon, whether they are societies of people or whether in the digital society we're going to have both. But I think that we can take the ideas of people like Ostrom, um, people like Ober, um, particularly people like Kat, and we can do better than this.